Welcome everybody. Uh, I can see the, the scary number of people out there that I'm talking to and none, none of you that I can see. So welcome. Uh, and I hope I can take you somewhere really warm and exotic for the next um, three quarters of an hour or so. So Guyana, the last true wilderness. Um, I suppose there are other places that have been called the last true wilderness, but this is a fabulous country. Um, I happen to be able to have the good fortune of going there twice. Um, as part of, um, as well as working with Trust in that time, I also did some, or and I still do, when we can actually start going on holiday again, did uh, led some trips um, for wildlife travel. And uh, I think it was 2009, I went out on a recce trip to Guyana. And, um, and then subsequently, I took a group out in 2014. So this talk is a combination of the two, two trips. And it really, it's a place where you need a bit of a sense of adventure to go to because it's um, uh, yeah, it's a lot more difficult to get around, you say, than say Costa Rica or Ecuador, where some of you may have been to. Um, but it's a fabulous place and it really is, a lot of it is unexplored. So what I'll do is to tell you a little bit about Guyana at first, and then we'll get into the wildlife. So, and I'll take you, the route we'll be taking is mainly the route I did on the first trip and um, we'll talk about some things that happened on the second trip as well. So anyway, here we go. So um, start off with a picture of the Kaitor Falls, one of the great places in the world and um, we'll come back to that towards the end. Okay, so Matt, where is Guyana? About 50% of the people I spoke to when I said I was going to Guyana said, oh, uh, is that in Africa? Well, no, it's not. Um, it's up here. You can see it in the northeast corner of the South American continent. Um, surrounded by Venezuela and Brazil with Suriname, which is the old Dutch Guinea um, to its east. So um, yeah, it borders, you know, borders the Atlantic there. Um, and um, yeah, they're surrounded by some, some pretty big countries. It's quite difficult to see, so you might have to get quite close to the, um, to the screen here, but where I'm taking you tonight is we start in Georgetown. And um, we make our way, I don't know if you can see the arrow, down through central uh, Guyana into the forests and uh, right down here to Dardanoa and then we're back up to the Kaitia Falls and then back to Georgia. So that's where I'm taking you tonight. So a little bit about Guyana first, just some very, very basic um, facts about Guyana. It gained independence from Great Britain in 1966 and is the only English speaking country in the mainland of South America. It's 83,000 square miles and uh, just for comparison, as everyone does, I looked up in Belgium, so it's a lot bigger than Belgium. It's, uh, and the United Kingdom is about 12,000 square miles, so it's, it's about the side of England, I think, really. Um, 80% of that is or, or was but um, around that is still rainforest much of which remains unexplored its main industries at the moment are bauxite uh, mining sugar and timber and the main agriculture is sugar cane and rice so they're it, it, its main industries and one of the reasons why we went i went on the recce first is they're trying to build up the ecotourism uh, and wildlife tourism to try and you know which helps towards the conservation of these fabulous areas that you find in Guyana. So the population, 800,000, that's the estimate about four years ago. Um, of that, 50% are East Indian origin, a lot of the original Guyanese um, or uh, colonialism that came over from the, um, from the East Indies and Asia. 36% um, Afro-Caribbean and about 7% are Amerindian, you know, the, the native population there, so it's quite small. Most of the people, 80 to 85%, live in, in the coastal belt. So very, very sparsely populated uh, in the interior. So when you fly in, um, you fly into Georgetown, which is the, by far the biggest town, the capital city of Guyana very coastal, very low lying, um, and has had you know, quite major flooding at times and, and is seriously, you know, with climate change and rising sea levels, is going to be even more threatened um, over the next few years. 
And that's basically the sea defences, the sea wall. And even when we were there on our first visit, the, the sea level was you know, not very far from the top of the walls. They had some basic sort of, um, what they do is big, have sort of channels that surround some of the houses and the roads and they dig those where when the water does come in, they try and drain it away. But it's a, it's a serious problem for them. From this picture here, you see and one of the big projects they have been trying to, to make sure uh, to help, you know, sort of combat some of this uh, uh, sea level rising uh, is, is to make sure the mangrove, to look after the mangrove um, forests on the, on, on the coastline there and actually try and create further, further, further barriers of mangroves uh, to try and alleviate some of, the, some of that flooding. Georgetown's a very interesting place. It's got a lot of colonial features from, let's say, from its sort of um, British past. Uh, that's the main square, uh, the market. Um, and you can see it's got other, other colonial um, uh, memorabilia as well, because it's got a Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken there, I just noticed as well. So, so different types of colonial past there. A lot of the buildings are wood. Uh, this is their Royal Courts of Justice with uh, Queen Victoria outside. A uh, very, very attractive building. And they've got this fabulous church, St George's Church, which um, we were told was the biggest wooden, totally wooden building um, in the world, they were claiming. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it's very spectacular. Problem is, um, it's permanently being eaten away by insects and termites and things as well. So it's a bit of a problem trying to maintain that. It was a very, very striking building. And uh, I know that I think there'll be one or two cricket fans out there, so I thought I'd put this in. Is uh, of course because uh, they're British past, they're the only they you know, they they um, play cricket there, much to the amusement of the rest of South American continent. Um, but this is a new ground they built, um, yeah, a few years ago um, because they do play test there, and they have produced some very good cricketers in the past, some very well known ones. There's, Clive Lloyd I'm on your left hand side, a great West Indian captain, and Shivrani Chandra Paul, um, who also you know, played for a long time for the West Indies, very good cricketer. So that's just a little um, introduction to, you know, to Guyana um, and Georgetown. Um, when you fly in on these tours uh, or trips, you obviously go to Georgetown and um, you can start your bird watching straight away uh, in Georgetown because. Uh, a place that if you are going to, to you must visit, are the um, botanical gardens. And well, we were, both trips were in the spring, uh, March, April time. And um, this is uh, one of the heronries. It's got um, great white herons in there, and cattle egret um, as well, nesting and different types of herons. Um, and they're the cattle egret, and we went in the um, springtime. As you can see when um, the chicks are just hatched out, and so there's a hungry cattle egret chick down there. And it's fabulous. It's just uh, in, in, uh, you know, it's not a big park at all, and it, it, you know, it does get very busy. So it's always best to go um, early morning. I know on the first trip that we went on the recce trip, I think we arrived at midnight, had a meal at one o'clock, and they said, "Oh, you're getting up at five o'clock because it's the best time to go." So, um, but it was worth it in the end. So, um, had little blue herons there. Um, you know, which are very striking. There's about four or five different varieties of herons all in the same tree that we saw. And then an even smaller one called the striated heron. And very, you know, very happy to be close to you. This is a snail kite um, that would actually come and you know, perch in a tree quite near you. Um, as you can see, it has a very uh, long elongated top bill, curved bill, and, and this feeds uh, especially on on the apple snails, which are very big, um, and they can use that beak to prise in and get out, you know, get get out the snail. Um, so you know, it's got a particularly niche feeding me mechanism for it. But yeah, they were very cl very close by. Lots of trees in fruit, and this is um, a red-shouldered macaw. You can just about see its red patch on there, um, and there's quite a few. And, and, through, throughout Guyana, there's a great variety of parrots, parakeets, and macaws. And um, this is a lovely little bird, not much 
but smaller robin about the size of a great tit with a fantastic name of Violaceous euphonia. Now, really colourful birds, and um, they, were, they were very common flitting about the trees. Um, and they were, as many birds were, they were very colourful, as was this one, with the yellow oriole. Um, very spectacular, um, especially when they're in flight. Really bright flesh, um, yellow. And um, much like our golden orioles that we occasionally get over here, I suppose, same family. And then you, know, you get some really striking woodpeckers. Uh, this is a lineated woodpecker. And if you can imagine a uh, carrion crow sticking to the side, it's about the size of a carrion crow with this very, um, yeah, very sort of um, angry looking beak, I suppose. Very striking color. Now lineated woodpeckers um, are found right across South America and Central America and right up into North America. So they're, they're fairly common and something that you are very likely to see over, um, over in Guyana. But this next one though is you have to go to Guyana to see it. Uh, this is a blood colored woodpecker, which is an endemic to the Guyanas, not just Guyana, but Suriname and the French Guyana as well, found in a little patch um, uh, of coastline very limited range. Uh, we're very pleased to see that. Got the very typical woodpecker features of, you know, with four toes, with two pointing front and two pointing back, pointing back. Yeah, so it's a very, very, again, very striking bird. It's very nice to see that within you know, half an hour of arriving at the gardens. So that's just a, you know, just a tiny few birds that we saw in the park and you can spend a lot of time there uh, and you see a lot of different birds as well, but not just birds. Um, there is a, a quite a large area of water there, which has a manatee in it. So I was very delighted to see this um, poke its head just above the surface. Quite often you don't see it. Um, and we don't, can't remember if we saw it on the second trip or not, or um, not such a good view, but on the first trip, uh, we had this very good view of a manatee as it poked its head underwater. So it's really nice to, to, to see that as well. So from, from um, Georgetown, we then um, moved out and we got on a plane. You fly in these small planes, um, 12 seaters, uh, because that's really, unless you take a very, very long river trip down the Yesequibi River, um, then you get in one of the small planes. Um, yeah, so that's a 12 seater. Oh, yeah, I'm jumping the gun. The first, the first trip on the recce trip, we didn't see these. Um, so I'm very pleased in the second trip because on the second trip, when we did the wildlife travel tour, we spent a few more, a couple of days around Georgetown. And one day we, we went birding around other areas, which is lovely. Uh, and we saw these, it's the Guyanese national bird. It's a Hawatsin. And probably this is the, um, the nearest thing you'll see to the, the regarding a bird to its um, reptilian ancestry because it still has on on the forewing near the carpal joint it has a hook still um, um, so it, it's really the closest bird that we've got and um, to, to to reptiles um, they, 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 you find them you know across northern um, south South America. Um, but I was very pleased that we were able to see this. So yes, we're now on the flight. Um, we're going in, into the, uh, the heart of the rainforest now. And um, as you fly out, you, you, you know, the, the landscape changes. You're going over the rice fields, first of all. <coughs> and then on to the, you know, to the start of the edge of the forest, some of which has um, already been mined and, and, and um, yeah, some, some cleared, uh, land cleared as well. But event, you know, not too long, you get into the depth of the forest. And for the next, I think it was the next 35 minutes or so, it looked like you're flying over an extraordinarily large piece of broccoli. It was just an unbroken forest. It was fantastic. And it took 35 minutes to get to our um, first stop. Um, which was the Iwakrama Centre. Um, on the first trip, we, they have a landing strip there, but it was flooded, so we had to go a bit further on and then get some um, transport back. But that was our first night. So this is a um, 
it's a research centre. It's one of the uh, network of rainforest research centres um, that that are con continually monitoring and surveying uh, and researching into rainforests. And um, it is a fantastic place, um, right there in the clearing, and that's virtually all, all there is to it there. And um, but they also have you can just see down in the corner some uh, lodges for tourists as well. So as well as housing researchers, um, they were trying to develop and, and encourage um, small groups to go there as well. While we were there on the first trip, there was a group from Oxford University looking at the um, the um, measure or trying to research and look at and get some idea of the, the value, <laughs> a monetary value of the ecosystem services that the rainforest provides, so which is interesting there. Um, right, and at that time, we've got this, they had just negotiated a brown break, breaking deal to try and help Guy, Guyana um, save save the rainforest and look after the rainforest give them the re reasons good reasons to keep the rainforest as it is um so there was an agreement to pay for the first time for their upkeep as utilities that provide vital services such as rainfall generation carbon storage and climate regulation and what that agreement was that Norway agreed to provide Guyana with up to 250 million pounds a year for five years um, towards this, uh, yeah, this project that will hopefully encourage Guyana to not um, sort of damage the, the rainforests or, or um, too much. Um, and you have to bear in mind that Guyana is one of the poorest um, of, of the uh, of the South American countries, so it was um, a, you know, quite a big deal for them, and um, you know, and that was signed, I think, in eight, 2011, and um, did go on to 2016. Um, so there um, is is a, a centre where a lot of the research is carried out. As going there as um, on, on one of their sort of wildlife trips, um, there, there's no, there's no I'll talk about the road um, uh, later on, because I know some people, I think some people who are looking um, <laughs> uh, tonight came with me on that trip and um, they'll certainly remember the road, but I'll come back to that later. So if you're going, you know, when you go out looking for, for wildlife, you have to use other means and quite often, you know, that's um, by using a boat. Um, and it is one of life's great uh, um, treats is to go down a river and see the wildlife either side. And um, certainly from here, and, and to here, there's, there's one sort of trail through the forest, which you have to access by boat anyway. So on both occasions, we did this. And as you go down the river, um, there's birds all over the place, really, uh, like this capped heron, a very smart, lovely blue-faced, um, sort of yellowy, yellowy front and black cap. Um, yeah, which was you know, not, not an uncommon bird there. And of course, um, I don't know if that's a tou toucan that Michael tried to, uh, to draw for me, but this is a white-throated toucan. Uh, and they would just fly across the rivers um, from tree to tree. And you think, oh, that's lovely seeing two. What can be better than seeing a toucan? Uh, and the answer is seeing three flying across. And um, they, they are magnificent birds. Um, very, very, very striking. And uh, so, so some of you people with long memories remember them from the Guinness adverts. And um, so it's really nice to see them in the wild. If some of you um, have ever been to the rainforests uh, and you get very excited and you go birding in the rainforest and um, you hardly see anything. There's lots of birds in there and there's lots of sounds that surround you. Um, but it's actually quite hard to see birds. So um, especially on the first trip, we were really lucky. Um, uh, and our luck was in because the, the, the route we were taking, uh, there was a big column of, of ants going right across in front of us. And of course that attracts a lot of the birds. 
uh, and that they follow the ant, you know, the, the marching ants um, about the forest and pick them off. And so consequently, there's a lots of uh, ant birds out there uh, of, uh, of different varieties. And this is a white plumed ant bird. Uh, and a rufous throated ant bird as well. Very striking. Um, but not always easy to see. As I said, it does um, often depend on the, uh, uh, the whether ants are around at the time you're there or not. The one trail is, um, it's, it's not a long trail, but um, it's, it's quite hard. To, it, it ascends um, a little bit. And of course, you're walking through a, a very, very hot and humid rainforest. That's quite energy sapping. And um, you know, I always commend our, our travellers for, um, for, for being quite sprightly on the way up. They're very, very good. But, you know, some of the birds you saw are fantastic. Like this, um, in, in full song here. Mannequins, uh, all varieties of mannequins have this sort of leg displaying where the um, males line up along uh, a twig and then sing and dance and jump over each other and the females look on and then pick one, uh, I suppose. Um, but that was a lovely one we saw in full, in full song. And then one of the weirdest birds you'll ever see and hear, unfortunately I haven't got a recording of it, um, is uh, the capuchin bird. Um, you get capuchin monkeys, but this is capuchin bird, which looks like a cross between a bird and a monkey, really. It really is a strange, strange looking bird. It has got the most weirdest of sounds, which we did hear on the first trip, not the second, I think. Um, yeah, it's quite, quite a big bird, uh, and the sound is like a metallic um, sort of... Um, um, sorry about that. Something went wrong there. But yeah, Capuchin bird is a really um, super bird to see. Um, but you gradually make your way up, uh, and when you finally get to your destination, which is um, what they call Turtle Mountain, it's not really mountain, but you get this fabulous view over, uh, over the rest of the forest. And then you get these swallow tail kites that are just sort of um, gently gliding around above you. Uh, and yeah, so we've got three of them, which is lovely. Again, beautiful birds. Um, didn't get a picture of one, but then as, um, on the second trip, there was a fantastic display by an orange-breasted falcon, which uh, Ron, our guide, insisted was the fastest, fastest, bird in, um, fastest bird in the world, even faster than the peregrine. Um, but uh, yeah, these swallowtail kites were a yeah, nice common sight over, uh, and you just get this staggering view over the, over the forest. Um, okay, at night it's worth going out just around, um, just around the camp, and um, you'll come across you know, night jars sitting in the road. Uh, and they just sit there and you go right up to them and you can you know, surround them and they just seem quite happy where they are. So this, is, this was a blackish night jar. Um, not a very original name really. I suppose someone who saw it first said, oh, it looks a bit blackish and the name st stuck. But um, yeah, lots of different night jars and night hawks over there. And just to get close up to one of these birds and you can just see the lovely whiskers uh, along the side there. Very, very nice. And there was another one as well, uh, even more prominent whiskers. And this was a, um, a ladder-tailed nightjar as well. Um, they they just sit on the road for warmth, and then we'll gradually get up and chase around and start looking for moths as well. So, yeah, very nice. It's always worth going out when you know at the dark because it's, it's dark by sort of half past six, and by the time you had your meal. Um, you spend about half an hour an hour walking around. Very, very nice. So I said we were following the, the, the first trip we went on and then we went a bit further down, not that further down from um, Iwakrama. And this is Atta Lodge, which is really there for the canopy walkway, which we'll go on in a minute. And I don't know if you can see, um, on the first trip we went, they didn't actually have any sleeping accommodation as such. So on the left hand side of the building there, you can see the hammocks, which we all slept in, uh, which is quite interesting, say on the, on, on the first trip with the, the age of some of the people on that trip trying to negotiate getting in and out hammocks and um, 
especially if you wanted to uh, get up in the middle of the night. Um, it was uh, probably not when people got that good a night's sleep there, but it was a very interesting experience. By the time we got there on our second trip, um, they actually built you know, a lodge. And um, so that was a bit more comfortable. But I have to say at this stage that the, um, the accommodation is, is, is fairly basic, but it's very comfortable, it's very clean. The food was really good and the people were lovely. So then um, you just need to have somewhere to sleep really. So that wasn't, wasn't a problem at all, but um, they were really, really nice places. So one of the reasons to go here is that you go on the Canopy walkway. So on the first trip, um, we set off to um, go along the, um, go, go along up to the canopy, uh, but something was blocking our path. Now this is one of my, I haven't got many photographs, I don't take photographs, so this is mine, and it's quite blurry because laying across, right across the path onto, um, to get onto the walkway uh, was this snake, the fur de lance, which I think you know, is thought to be the most poisonous snake and the most horrible snake to be bitten by. I think you've got about 20 minutes of agonizing death if you get bitten by one of these. So um, that's why I say you do need, a, I mean, you get them all over South America, so you, but you do need a bit of a spirit of adventure. And if a, one of these is laying across your path, you, um, you just retreat and wait until it's gone, basically. Um, you, don't, you don't try and step over it at all. So, um, but after about you know, 20 minutes, it slid, slid away. And just to think other things that, that frighten you to death, our, our, on the second trip, our guide, Ron, rather, he, he preferred to sleep in a hammock. He was just about to get into his hammock and one of these scorpions was in the bottom. So you do have to, do have to be a little bit aware and look out for these, uh, these minor inconveniences um, on your trip. So anyway, that's the walkway. Um, yeah, it, it's an um, interesting, um, interesting experience. If you don't like heights, it's a bit sort of worrying, but uh, it's certainly worth going up there. Because um, oh, you're up in the canopy and so you're seeing a lot of birds at the canopy level because the interesting thing with a lot of the birds in, in the rainforest is that they stay at different levels. You get the ground, you know, the, the birds near the ground that exist near the ground and then in the middle canopy and then up to the, to the top canopy. So you do see different birds on different layers of the forest uh, and you get stunning views across. And you get very close to, yeah, some of these mid canopy birds like this common toady flycatcher, which is not much, that much bigger than the gold crest. Um, the, the whole range of toady flycatchers out there, this is the common one, but very striking. And of course, where there's food, um, there's a whole family that we don't get anywhere in Europe called tanagers, and this is a turquoise tanager. Uh, feeding on, on the berries and um, yeah so it's quite difficult to take photographs um, right but photographs um, if you can ask a question about the photographs and the excellent photography please don't because none of them are mine <laughs> and so I won't be able to tell you what Karen was used what I would, most, all these photographs were taken at the time on the tours um, that we took and I'm very grateful to Phil Palmer from Bird Holidays who went on the first trip and Charles Waters who came on our wildlife travel trip for, for most of these photographers, uh, photographs there. Uh, but yeah, that's a turquoise tanner gun. And so it's very difficult to take um, photographs while on the walkway because they're bouncing, because if you they all, they bounce, you know, as you're walking along, they, they really bounce and I'm trying to keep steady um, to take photographs very good. So Phil did a great job with these. And I thought I'd show these, these were um, because a lot of the lodges and at night and during the daytime, get some lovely butterflies and moths around. And say so these were all taken by Charles, Charles Waters on the, on the second trip because he's very into his butterflies and moths. And um, yes, uh, you put out, especially at night, you put out um, on, under one of the lights a white, you know, a white sheet, and you get all sorts of brilliant moths like the Sphinx moth down on the right hand side. Um, uh, yeah, it's fabulous. It's, it'd be a whole talk in itself, the butterflies. Are, of Moss of Guyana, just, just a fabulous selection. Wherever we went, there was a really, really good um, range of butterflies and moss. Okay, um, you, you go down, you go along the road. There's only one way. This is the one road in Guyana, and it goes all the way from Georgetown down to um, 
the southwest. And this is a carousel, a black carousel walking on the road. And uh, but you, on the road, it, it, it's because you don't go into the forest at all, most of it. So um, you just have to um, bird watch and wildlife watch from the road. Um, but there's always interesting birds going over, like a plumbeous kite we have here, um, a grey headed hawk, uh, a yellow headed vulture, a very big vulture there. And about every 200 meters, there's a roadside hawk perched on the um, perched on the side of the tree. Uh, and then there are some very colourful, like this Amazonian uh, white-tailed white-tailed trogon, yeah, very striking, just just all along the side of the road. Um, and it's always worth stopping at a little bit of water. Um, uh, you also get the red rumped agoutis going across uh, in front of you as well. You quite often see you saw quite a few of those. As I said, the, um, you often see it's worth stopping at water because there could be hummingbirds and the second trip we saw an otter or one of them, a river otter. Um, this lovely, or these two lovely hummingbirds are crimson topaz, which are fabulous. And you think that's good. Have a wait till you see this picture. Just fantastic, look at that. I feel top that, I don't know how he got that, but that is just a wonderful, wonderful picture. Um, so you get some very, very good smallest birds to some of the biggest birds uh, on this trip. Um, also, as you walk in, you get a, a variety of reptiles and amphibians. This is one of the vine snakes uh, that we saw, uh, one or two of. Um, yeah, they are, they're not venomous, but um, they can give you, yeah, if you got too close, they give you a, a bit of a nip and it could be a bit unpleasant. And then this, this very boot laced in um, type of um, whip snake type bird, uh, bird, snake. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's not, not just the birds of interest there. So we came to um, the next stop was Surama village. This is one of the bigger villages in the forest. Um, and and this, this is entirely run by the indigenous people there. Um, on the previous trip, uh, these wrecky trips have been once or twice, and I've got this picture. And, um, you know, the children were fascinated when, when we all come in. And uh, just the story with this is that we got here, we had lunch and um, Ron, our guide said, okay, we're gonna meet two local guides and they'll take you somewhere special. Uh, and so, yeah, two o'clock, we turn up at your appointed place and um, and these two little lads, that one there and that one there, um, were hanging around. And then Ron said, oh, these are our guides. <laughs> And these, these two little lads have gone into, into the forest and found something quite special. And so we went off and we walked for about an hour in the forest, in the rain, these boys were just dressed as they are there. Um, and we were very happy walking. And then uh, they took us to this tree and um, they just pointed to look, look up at the tree. Uh, and there was a harpy eagle. This is a juvenile. And those boys had actually found and, uh, this harpy eagle nest. Uh, and I think they're about nine, eight or nine years old at the time. Um, don't really think that uh, we'll be very happy if eight or nine year olds from, from Britain suddenly walked off into wood for about an hour on their own. But these boys are very, very, um, very aware of their environment and knew their environment and knew what was around a lot. But yeah, they pointed out this, this fantastic the harpy eagle, which um, is, is that along with the Philippine monkey eagle thought to be the biggest um, bird of prey in the world. So this is a juvenile one, which is fantastic. So we went back to the village and, and then we got taken to another place to see more special birds. Uh, and this great putu, which was, um, just sitting there waiting. This is obviously active at night, so it sits there and being camouflaged during the daytime. And even better is this common putu, which if you still can't work it out, is this branch up here going up the left hand side is a bird. Um, and that's how it stays for the daylight hours and then goes out hunting at night. Um, absolutely fantastic camouflage. Um, so it's a real privilege to see some of these birds. We had a brief stop at, uh, in this village. Um, there's um, a, a lodge called Rockview Lodge, which is probably the, the most, um, in terms of accommodation, is the most, most luxurious, but it's far from luxurious. But um, it's quite nice to have a warm shower 
um, that actually worked at times. Um, and just outside, you had these sort of buff breasted, um, well, buff necked ibises walking by um, with lots of other birds as well. Uh, on the second trip, uh, you thought, well, the best place is to watch birds is on the runway because this is one of the main areas around there. So, again, this is another evening we went out looking for night jars and we probably saw about four or five different uh, varieties of them. But on the first trip, as well as finding out the wildlife, it was nice to find out about all the, um, you know, about the communities and what they're doing. So we were taken to this um, school um, uh, in Anai village uh, here, and the children gave us a really nice, lovely display uh, of, of telling us all about the wildlife, the jungle, and how important it was. And there's a visitor where he got involved in a ceremony. I can't remember quite what it is, the, the ceremony. Um, uh, but somehow I ended up with a wife, um, which I had to leave behind. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was very nice to see um, around, you know, go around, look around and talk to, talk to the teachers and talk to the children. We also went to a, a really lovely peanut butter they make there as well. So that was all part of um, uh, our recce trip as well, is getting to get to know some of the communities. So we're now moving out into the more away from the forest, into the more savanna type land. Um, right, I thought I'd show you the, the, the vehicle and this will um, bring back some awful memories for those who came on the, on the wildlife travel trip, but this is the only means of getting through on the road. The road, we traveled about 40, no, just 54 kilometers in about eight and a half hours. And sometimes it was so bumpy and it's got no suspension at all. Uh, <laughs> if you had back conditions, it was murder, but it was the only way of getting through. But the advantage of it was, is that, you know, going, you're at, um, yeah, so you know, you're at a reasonable height to see, to see birds going and, and other things. But you saw red bellied macaws going by. That's, um, again, lots of different parrots around. As well as that, you saw mammals like this um, wedge-capped capuchin monkey who were very curious and us going by. Uh, and uh, I say because we were up higher, uh, that's one of the advantages of um, being in the, in the Bedford Burn. And uh, we had great views of the sloth. Uh, this is a three-tailed sloth. And the great thing about these is they don't run away. Um, in fact, an uh, interesting experience. I think on, on the, um, the, second, the second trip, um, <laughs> we stopped and um, Liz, who was in the van at the time, we, we had to flat down. So we said, oh, Liz, lift, lift a flat up, flap up. And then she got that <laughs> and got that close within about two feet of a, of a sloth looking at her. And as you can see at the top, there's the, um, the three, th three toes of the three toes sloth. So you got some really great views of, of, of animals um, uh, at that level. Okay, I'm just going to realise um, time's going on, so we've got, still got a bit of way to go. So we've got um, yeah, puffbirds along the track, um, spotted puffbird and Guyana and puffbird. And again, another one of these great big woodpeckers. This is a crimson crested. So then on the first trip we moved on, we were going down to Karanambu, but we were this time we we're going to go down by boat and follow the river down. And um, again, fantastic trip. Saw so boat build herons just along the way. These have got really wide bills, lovely birds. Kokoi heron, which is quite a bit bigger than our own gray heron. We had white hawks sitting in the tree and just these black skimmers floating by um, completely um, unaware that we're there really. In fact, they just go over the boat. If, you, if, they, if you're in line with them, they just, you know, just come over the boat and just catching their fish. If you can see on, might be able to see on this, that their, their lower mandible is longer than the upper mandible they use for scooping fish out of the water as they fly. And yeah, the other residents of the river were quite curious as well. This is um, a giant river otter looking at us. Um, and if it gets out of the water, these are big. These are going to be up to two meters in length. Very, very big, big animals. And spectacle came and just lolloping about on the sand as we went by again, fairly uninterested in our presence. Uh, that's a big, big, big beast as well. So right at Karanambu, um, again, very basic lodges, but you know, quite comfortable. And this was at the time was run by this lovely 
lady called Diana McTurk, um, who set up there many, many years ago to look after um, orphan river otters and look after them and then release them back in the wild. You can see one there and did a fabulous job. Very sadly, after our second visit about, well, it's about three years ago now, four years ago, and she died and, um, but someone else had taken on. But she was a lovely, lovely, lovely woman, very redoubtable, tough, but very engaging woman. And that's her with, with the group. And uh, she spent much of the evening tell, telling us how much she fell in love with David Attenborough when, when he came out to do some building. Uh, filming and, and she said she he st she still was in love with him that was in 2014. Wonderful woman really did some great work out there uh, and that's one of her, her comps that's Whiskers. She was just so successful that uh, she, they were having to re relocate otters further and further away from, from, from where she was because she had such great success in, in rearing these orphaned otters. One of the great experiences I remember from there is evening after dinner, it was about, you know, just, just coming out to dusk, we went out um, on, on the river. One of the things to see what you put up till night. And what you do is just go out and then you just hang around a bit and um, they get out the rum punch and the homemade cookies and you just lie there uh, and sit there and wait for things to happen. Uh, and this happened on our trip there. You know, this, really strange bird came towards us and luckily landed in a tree right beside us which was a sun bitten which is um one of its own kind it can't make up its mind whether it's a, a wader or a heron um but it's a fantastic bird and it, it can fan its tail and um, to review to um reveal spots that hopefully will frighten pet, uh, predators away yeah and that was a real joy to see but as it got darker um the flowers of the um the victoria water lilies come out and um just just wonderful and you're under this absolutely wonderful wonderful unpolluted sky I've never seen a sky like it just fabulous but you have to come back in the end and as you come back um first yeah, the other every other tree had one of these hanging from it the tree bowers and what they do is they just hang about on the tree and, and try and catch the passing bats that fly by them and they're actually doing quite well because there was a lot of them. Um, and then again, another you know, got back on land, walking back to the uh, to the lodge, and uh, this white-tailed nightjar, uh, which was so set on staying there, they actually allowed us to pick it up, um, and it didn't, still didn't fly off. And we put it back down again, and it just remained there. Fabulous, um, uh, yeah, fabulous experience. Okay, we're going down to the farthest south we went, when we only went on the first trip. And this was a plane that we used most of, you know, or this type of plane we used most of the time to get around. Um, so we're now we're going down to the real ranch lands, uh, to Dada, Dada Wama um, Ranch, a huge ranch, now, I can't remember how, something like about 50,000 acres or something. Um, we stayed in this lodge and we decided when we set up the itinerary for the tour not to go here because it just wasn't too basic. It was um, no windows, you know, no glass in and uh, holes in the floor and things like that. It's a great experience though. Found out all about ranching down there, um, you know, very low density. Um, and talked to the cowboys, the gauchos, um, to explain, you know, and we you know, did explain how you know, about the lifestyle down there and um, how they farmed. And um, I have to say, without upsetting non-meat eaters, that was some of the best beef I've ever tasted. It was absolutely lovely. Um, can't see the bird here, but we're looking for one of the world's rarest bird, which we did see, which is a red siskin. Um, unfortunately, didn't get a picture of it, but uh, yeah, so some rare birds there. And some birds uh, look for a familiar type, and this is a pied lapwing. Um, and that's a Patagonian snipe, although I think that's called a snipe, they call it a Patagonian snipe. And the equivalent of mouse going kolu, which is a, a, a double striped thick knee. Um, so they're all of the same family. Um, and then uh, the, the, um, the burrowing owls, just fabulous. Bit like our little owls, um, but they all yeah they make their nest in the ground and then sit sit on top of a mound looking for their food. Um, great to see. But one of the reasons we came down here, um, 
and luckily we saw them on both trips uh, um, elsewhere, is one of my most favourite animals, which is a giant anteater. That is um, just an amazing animal, very long, very, uh, yeah, it's, again, two metres long. It, it, if it stood up against me, it would tower above me. And, but you don't, they're very passive, but if, they, if cornered, you don't want to get near them too much with their rear up and their front claws are just, just deadly. But absolutely fabulous animal. And I'm um, so pleased to see one of those. Okay, we're going to end up in Kaitur. So we then flew up to Kaitur. Uh, and this is, this is the visitor center here. Um, the fabulous thing about Kaitur is it's one of the great, great waterfalls of the world, but um, it's got no visitor center there. There's no one, no, no health and safety rails. There's only 12 of you at a time because it only takes one plane load of 12 people at a time. So there's no one there. Um, you either fly in or, or you walk from Georgetown. It takes three days um, to get there. Um, and here the, it shows you that um, what they're saying is that although it's not the big pool, big falls like you have the Victoria Falls or the uh, Iguazu or the Niagara Falls. Um, it isn't a great wide waterfall, there's lots of different um, falls to it. It's just one, one single fall, it's got the longest drop of 226 meters. Um, just fabulous. So once you get off the plane, you just walk. Um, it should take about half an hour, but there's things to see on the way. And what you need to do is look at in all the bromeliads because uh, they contain, or some of them will contain this, a golden frog. And that's an adult golden frog. Uh, Charles took this picture and it's about, well, about the size of your thumbnail, if that. And it lives all its life in, in the water inside the bromeliad. It raises its young in there. And you really have to search hard for them. But yeah, it's again, fabulous sight. There's particular birds you want to see, uh, or you can see up here, um, again, on the first trip. And we were very pleased to see this. This is a Guyanan cock of the rock, a female, which is great to see. If you think, oh, I'd really like to see a male. Uh, and then lucky enough, um, one appeared and we saw this bright orange flash in the, in, uh, in the trees, quite close by. Just look at that. It's just absolutely this staggering bird. Uh, and again, uh, these cock of the rocks um, have these fun, you know, these wonderful displays, uh, legs where they, um, you know, they, they raise the crest and um, do all sorts of wonderful dances. And um, so they, you know, um, absolutely pleased to see those. But anyway, eventually you get to the falls and there they are, this thunderous roar uh, as it goes over and then follows down um, down towards Georgetown. It takes about three days to walk there. Um, you know, just on the edge, no safety rails, nothing there. Uh, no one's selling you anything. Um, just, just absolutely brilliant. And a uh, you know, real privilege to be able to go there. Okay, so that's a quick tour. Then we went back to Georgetown. Uh, did three, just want to quickly finish on three. Um, Three issues, uh, you know, that, uh, that Guyana are facing, and that they were facing when we were there. A couple of this, um, if you can see this map, you see this long line that goes, red line that goes, you know, across the middle. Uh, that's the road we we travelled on, and there's been huge pressure to build the road and upgrade it. And particularly, it's coming from Brazil, which is around here from the northeast Brazil, because they want because it's actually in terms of distance is not that far to Georgetown and they want to get you know, their, their goods to port up there. So there's, um, there, it's quite controversial and there has been some, um, they have started uh, to, to actually sort of upgrade some of it. Um, you know, lots of people wanted it. There's lots of people who didn't want it. The, the, you know, the, some of the Indian, the, the Amerindian populations were very unkeen. They didn't want their, their the forest boiled, um, and it's not just the road going through because it will then create barriers. And there's, but there's all the ancillary work that goes on beside it. So, so now that that is still running on, I think. Um, um, so that's a, that's the state of the road. That's the main road, or the only road that go, cuts across Guyana. So it, it's a very difficult issue for them. 
Um, but I say it's some place I have started to um, to give access to certain areas near a Georgetown at the moment, but um, I'm not sure how how much longer they can hold out. And since we've been um, some of the the Norway um, contract with Norway uh, ended. And since then, some of the um, you know, some Chinese logging companies have gone in and hold quite you know started to, to own bits of the forest and start some sort of um, timber production, and, um, which again is is uh, um, a big issue about how they're going to to manage that because I think the Guyanese or the Guyanese government at the time really wanted to preserve the forest, but you know, it's, it's still got lots of timber there. It provides employment, so they're having to deal with that issue as well. Uh, and then also four years ago, they, there was these huge, starting to exploit these huge oil reserves uh, right along the Guyana coast into Suriname and French Guyana as well. So um, I, think this, you know, I think it's one of the biggest oil finds they've had for, for many a year. Uh, and that could have an enormous impact on, and, um, you know, on the economy of, of Guyana. So it's interesting though that obviously, you know, with, with the um, surplus amount of oil this last year, I think they've scaled back some reduction, but you now the impact that's going to have on Guyana on Georgetown and the money it will bring in um, is, is another issue that they've got to face as well. So there are big, big debates going on um, and big issues to discuss. Um, but at the moment, Guyana is still a fabulous, when you can go to visit it, it's still a fabulous place to go. Um, so this comes at the end, many thanks to the photographs again, Phil Palmer, Bird Holidays and Charles, Charles Waters who came on. It's really, really nice um, that you let me use those photographs, which I much appreciate. Um, so um, I just hope that Guyana can maintain that sense of much of that sense of wilderness uh, and um, support the, the people who want to conserve what is it a pure, a re really a real jewel. So, okay, that's that's all, folks. Sorry, I rushed you through there, but um, I hope you didn't mind. But um, yeah, thanks very much for, for for listening. Thank you, Mike. That was uh, that was fantastic. Thank you. A lot of people are uh, a lot of people very jealous. It seems very upset <laughs> with this. Yeah, they're not they're not in Guyana right now. So thank you. I've got, I've got a few questions, Mike. If you can if you can stop if you can just stop sharing your screen, um, see if I you can find that button there. Uh, oh, oh yeah, is it the green button? Red button. It's a red button. If I if yeah. I uh, if if I share mine, there we are. If I share mine, because uh, I did. There's a few people who are quite. You mentioned about the uh, capuchin bird. Yeah, and a few yeah. people, uh, Jess and Gabrielle, said it's. They went and played it online. It's quite an amusing noise. Now, if you can hear this at home, folks, you turn, if you turn your computer up, I, I've managed to download it. I think so. Hopefully, you can hear it. Oh, well done. S see if you can hear this, Mike. Yeah. Was that it? There'll be another one. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's that is brilliant. very strange. It's a well, weird looking you. thing as well. What, what a weird looking bird that is. Uh, no. it's absolutely delighted to see it. Thank, thank you. Was it Justin Gabriel? Was that? Yeah, well, they said, they said how amusing it was. So, uh, um, so look, I've got, yeah. got, a few, got a few questions. I've got a few questions just to, before you go, Michael. Um, Malcolm asked, are there any big cats over there in Guyana? There are there are a lot of big, there's jaguar, there are puma. Um, we didn't see jaguar there, unfortunately. It, they're not easy to see. Um, I have to say, um, the last trip I did was to Brazil, and we have fabulous views of jaguar. Um, but yeah, you know, the forest is full of jaguars there uh, in particular, and um, but not so easy to see. They're easy to see, um, you know, more easy to see in Brazil now. And, and, and Richard asked, did you see any spiders? Um, yes, we did. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I couldn't tell you which one. There were, there were some tarantula types. Um, how big? How big were they? I think the main thing is how big were they, Mike? I think. It's the, um, uh, well, the tarantulas are hand size. <laughs> See, that, that, uh, instantly, I'm not going to Ghana now. As it put me, he put me straight off. I'll, I'll, I'll go to the Isle of Wight instead. Um, <laughs> 
Oh, no, Alan said, Alan's, uh, Alan's very lucky. He says that he's due to go to Guyana in October. So best of luck with that, Alan. Oh, yeah. uh, what's a, what bird guide uh, would you recommend, Mike? Is there a book you can... Well, the, um, I, I don't know if people hold it, but um, there's a, the, the book, they haven't got a Guyana bird guide of its own. Um, so the ones we all use, but it's quite hefty, is in the uh, Helm Field Guides series. It's a bird of Venezuela. Can you, uh, can you hold it up, Mike, so we can see it? So... Oh. There we are. Look. It's a cock of the rock on the front, look. Yeah, okay. Guyana and Crocodile. So there's no there's no Guyana and Bird guy, and you get a, a Venezuelan one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's another there's a another one I think which is birds um, of North and South America because um, there's some I can't remember which one it is. I did have that, but I'm not sure where it is now. So um, so yeah, look out um, if, if they go on the NHBS website or one of the websites and. Type in bird book for Guyana. It's quite quite good. Um, yes, okay. nhbs.co.uk. Okay. Um, I think you answered most of the other questions. Might any other questions we don't answer because uh, there's hundreds of people watching, so we haven't got time for it for all of them. But uh, perhaps I'll, I'll pass one to Mike. You can perhaps uh, you can answer them later, Mike. No, but, but Chris asked uh, if you could go bird watching in one place in the entire world. Okay, so you got you got one <laughs> you got one place to go, Mike. Where would you go? Okay. I'm tempted to say Woods Mill, but I'm going to be a bit too crass on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, for, I th Guyana is, in terms of if it's just birds, will probably be the top. Um, if it's a, a general, more general wildlife and greater wildlife, um, I've been lucky enough to go to Botswana twice. And I thought that was unbelievable, um, Botswana. But I really like Guyana because it was... Um, yeah, it, you need you, you do need a spirit of adventure there, you know. It's um, but it, you you really you really benefited. We we saw thirty one species of raptor um, while we were there, um, and, we, you know, and you get really good views as well because the birds, you know, that aren't in deep in the forest, um, you know, aren't, aren't too worried about your presence. Uh, um, so yeah, guy, guy on I think. I think Guyana is where I've seen most bird species on any of the trips that I've done. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, well, thank you, Mike. Well, thank you for lifting our spirits on a, uh, a dark uh, on a dark Tuesday evening. So 